Miriam Meets on RTE Radio 1 with Miriam O'Callaghan. Hello there. My guests this morning are both emigrants from Dublin and both have made a significant contribution to life in America without ever losing their connection with their home place. Fanula Flanagan is an accomplished actor who has enjoyed critical success on stage and in the movies, as well as a television career ranging from her award-winning role in the 1970s drama series Rich Man, Poor Man to the recent cult series Lost. Her husband is Dr Garrett O'Connor, President of the Betty Ford Institute, an internationally recognised centre for addiction research, prevention and education. They are home in Ireland here for a few weeks with a very busy schedule, including delivering the Michael Little. Memorial Lecture, which is going to be broadcast on RT Radio 1 at 7pm on St. Stephen's Day. So I'm especially delighted to meet you both. Thank you. Delighted to meet you. Now, where did you meet? You actually had to go all the way to America to meet, is that right? (laughs) Yeah, we did. (laughs) We didn't know each other in Dublin at all, no. We met in Baltimore in Maryland and uh, I was on tour with Brian Friel's play Lovers back in 69. Well, I I was living there. I'd been there for about... um, Oh, eight or nine years, uh, with my wife and family, two kids. And uh, Fanula came through with, with lovers. And Eamon Morrissey came in with Fanula. And Eamon and I, who'd known each other before, went out drinking all afternoon and reminiscing and whatever, and went back. And he said, I want you to meet Fanula Flanagan. And so we went back to the Round Towner Motel, and we were walking up to her room, I think, on the third or fourth floor. That hotel is no longer there. It should be a memorial to us. Yeah, that's where we met. I was telling some kind of joke to Eamon and I was on all fours in the corridor. I have no idea what the joke was. I have to ask Eamon. He probably doesn't <laughs> remember either. So anyway, Fanula came out of a room and there I was on all fours. There he was, down on his hands and knees. Perfect Already. position, yes. <laughs> I said, this is the man for me. What was your first impression of him? Well, I, I thought he was very funny. You know, he made me laugh. And, uh, of course, that's a, a huge hook, I think it is anyway. Mm, definitely. M- um, made me laugh. And uh, he was very appealing and he's also very bright. And we began to see each other. And uh, and uh, then I went on with my tour. And, uh, and, and then much later on, I think Garrett's marriage was winding down. And, and uh, then we began to see each other much more seriously. And, and then a year later, we were living together. What was your first impression of her, Garrett? A very beautiful person came out of a room and uh, I was on my hands and knees looking up and, <laughs> and she laughed. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you're still laughing, which is good. Laughing, I know it's still yeah. a couple. But look, it was complicated because you were obviously both married at the time. Yes. Yeah, well, I wasn't. I had just been divorced, so it was, it was a little bit freer for me. But uh, Garrett was still married. Yeah, it was complicated. 40 years later? How Forty many? years later, and then we're we still got, together. We're oh, still yes. together, and and mm. we got married. Then uh, you know later when we moved to California, and then uh, Garrett's two boys came to live with us. So I married a group. You see, I didn't marry just one person. I got two uh, two boys, aged eleven and twelve. And was that difficult? Very difficult. I think probably much more difficult for Garrett because he was a parent caught in the middle, you know, and. Uh, that's much more difficult, I think, because you don't know where your loyalties lie. And for the two children, they just wanted their mommy and daddy back together. And I was the wicked stepmother, which is a very treasured title. And I worked hard to get it. So I keep it. I always look back on it and think they were like trained terrorists to come in to disrupt <laughs> this new, <laughs> to get rid of this femme fatale who had stolen me away, which wasn't true at all. Uh, because the marriage was indeed winding down. And Fanula then took over the rearing of these children, uh, Matt and Turk, who had done extraordinarily well, but not without their own difficulties. But we all survived this extraordinary uh, Why didn't their mother cataclysmic bring them up? Ad- adolescence. Well, the plan was at the time that we would take them. They were two boys. They wanted to be with their daddy. You know, I understand that totally. And... and um, they, it's impossible cross country or long distance to raise children. You just can't. So the plan was that they would come to us, and I have to say this was our plan. Um, they would come to us. We would rehabilitate them and send them back to their mother. You know, we treated them, I suppose, a plan like as though they were library books. You know, we'd take them and read them and send them back. And uh, of course, they defeated that, and we did too. And and then they came, and we saw that you know they, they, what they needed was a home. And uh, and I suppose we did too, really. And well, they came at a particularly yeah. critical time because uh, I was in the last five years of 
you know, 25 years of uh, pathological drinking. In those days, you probably never saw me sober because I used to drink in the morning, going into work in the car, and did stop the shakes happening. And so you, you live two lives, one at work and one at home, and when you get home, it all bursts out. But at what age did you start to drink? Oh, when I was, uh, well, I had TB when I was 12, and the, the treatment I was given for the TB was Guinness's stout. And uh, <laughs> I was out in the garden in a greenhouse. And they didn't send me to the hospital. My brother was in the hospital in the Richmond with bovine TB, and I was in the garden with lung TB uh, when I was 12. So they renovated a greenhouse, which I nicknamed the Sty, and I was put in there for seven months. <laughs> and um, just in the beginning of my hormonal awakening, it was an appallingly difficult time, the age of 12, and everything happening all at once. And uh, they brought in the stout, and I, I'll never forget Nanny, or, uh, or my Nanny, answering the phone one day. I could hear it in the kitchen. She answered the phone, and she said she was from Tyrone, and she said, "Oh, I the, the Iron Lung will be here at four o'clock." And I I heard this phone call about an Iron Lung arriving, and I thought, "Oh my God, it's for me." I mixed up polio and TB, and I was terrified. The Iron Lung was a sixty-four pint a barrel of stout one of the first metal uh, uh, casks that yeah. Guinnesses had used. And, of course, my father got it in and put it in the pantry and had to teach everyone exactly how to pull a pint. And um, he and I shared the iron lung uh, for a long time. I used to pour it out out the window of the glass house of my greenhouse and my mother's roses, which grew <laughs> like roses in some kind of mad scientist dungeon. And she had the gooseberry Guinness bushes there that all <laughs> took over the, my greenhouse. Um, by the end of the time I was in my TB, the seven months, I was drinking three or four pints of stout a day. I began to like it. And even when I got to Tongos, I would be brewing uh, beer and wine from raisins and things like that in hidden places in the college, just like in a prisoner of war camp, you know, a couple of us used to do it. I'd be drinking the altar wine, and I'd often be, uh, I became an acolyte in order to get to the altar wine. And I would pick out alcoholic priests to say mass for, and they would always ask for more. And you'd go back in and get another shot in the middle of the mass and go back That's and go over your soutan. <clears throat> you had a very different background in Dublin, didn't you? In other words, I think Garrett was quite middle class. You were quite well to do, Garrett, weren't you? Well, middle class. My father was a physician and the dean of the College of Surgeons. Yeah, we were middle class. Your background was very different, wasn't very it? Very different. I, well, first of all, I come from the north side. And uh, my father was, uh, uh, well, he did many, many things. And he was a socialist, Republican, um, very involved in his politics in his youth, went to Spain to fight against Franco. And I'm very proud of that, that he did that. And, um, but when my father would get drunk when, he, when I was young, and he drank a lot, and, and when he would get drunk and he would say to me, um, and I was about like five, six years of age at the time. Oh, darling, someday you'll save Spain. And so later on, this sort of became a mantra. And, and much later on, when I wanted to go into the theatre, I used to think, oh, what am I going to do about Spain? I have to <laughs> save Spain. And um, both my parents, they read voraciously. We had no money at all. And when we did have, um, you know, it quickly vanished and was hard to know where the next you know, pay packet was going to come from. He did work for the Irish press. He did work. He was uh, in the Irish army in the intelligence unit during the war, the emergency it was called. And um, uh, he uh, then he held many jobs. And then my mother, when things were really, really hard, my mother went out to work, which was, you know, and my mother went out and scrubbed floors initially when we were very small. And uh, I remember being horribly upset about that, that my mother would actually have to do that. And she worked for a family who was they were very nice, but, you know, it was mm. just horrible to feel that. And I was terrified that other children would find out. And, and when my father would... My father suffered from panic attacks, really. We called them temper tantrums at the time, but they were actually panic attacks. And sometimes he would just lose it, you know, and he would shout and make a scene in the street or in a shop or something. And, uh, and of course, as a child, you're terribly embarrassed. And, and I remember the overall feelings at the time being wanting to protect him from uh, being mocked or ridiculed by other children or other people, um, even though I'm sure many people understood what it was. But I didn't, but I knew that 
I needed to protect him. And of course, you know, no child should have to feel they need to protect their parent. And so that was a very sort of torn and difficult mm. time. And, and then my mother hated where we lived. We lived in a corporation house in Whitehall and she, she came from County Dublin and, and the countryside and, you know, had worked in the civil service and, and was uh, self-read, self-taught and beautiful, beautiful woman. And, and she was uh, destroyed by, you know, poverty and living in, in this, these circumstances, you know, two bedrooms, five children and a, a husband who sometimes could work, sometimes couldn't, and sometimes vanished for days on end. And yet, Gard, your family, although, was much more affluent. <clears throat> your mum, she wasn't that happy herself, or was she? Was your mum a happy person? Well, I don't know if she was happy or not, but she was, um, then, and she was an extraordinarily talented person who played in the second um, seat of the Radio Air and Orchestra in 1928, spoke four languages and played hockey for Ireland and was really a, a, a fluent Irish speaker, born in the Aran Islands, and, you know, was an extraordinary... Incredibly impressive. First, by the time I knew her, she was already um, beginning to be in the early stages of being a falling-down drunk. And she would often fall down, as a matter of fact, and have to be removed from public places. And the John's ambulance would come, and people would say it was her back. And she was addicted to barbiturates and alcohol and... Um, for most of the years I know her. But on the other hand, she was also captain of Castle Golf Club. And so she was able to, like like many alcoholics, able to um, achieve at the same time a struggle with the alcohol. But but I remember her as a, a marvelous woman and uh, who did her best. But I was, we had a nanny also who brought all of us up, including Ulick and Noreen and Michael and me and, and uh, Donna. She was 96 when she died. And... Uh, she was. We were divided between my mother and nanny. Was really the person. She who was a nanny, and she was a childminder. In other yes, words, she yeah, was a nanny. Ulick wrote a wonderful poem about her. In one yeah, of the I've books. read that. Uh, actually. Yeah, it's a lovely poem. You know, one of the things that uh, I just want to toss in here, Miriam, is because I have spoken about my family before um, in interviews here, and but uh, m- some people regarded my my saying that my father had been an alcoholic and naming what was his illness you know, and, and how it affected the whole family as some kind of indictment, where, of course, it's not an indictment, nor does it mean that I, I didn't passionately love both of them and they were devoted to us. Just they were, mm-hmm. they were in the grip of this, you know, in this terrible, terrible disease which, which goes down through generations. And I understand that now, but I didn't then. But um, it certainly was not an indictment of him or a reflection on him other than the fact that, you know, he he could not get well and nor did he really have the right opportunities to get well. OK, listen, we're going to take a piece of music, a nice piece oh. of music, and we'll come back. Oh, I think this is your choice, Gareth, the Carrick Fergus. Oh, good. You love that song? Yes, I do. I love it. I've always loved it. Because it's really about an alcoholic I wanted, <laughs> to, get so- <laughs> I wanted to get sober. <laughs> yes, it's like that. Oh, yes. You just listen to the words. I'm going to do that yeah. now. We're listening actually to Joan Byes and she's going to sing it for us this morning. Lovely. But I'll sing no more now Till I've had a drink And I'm drunk today I find it very moving during that because, Gareth, you grabbed Fanula's hand and you were holding it very tight. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> yeah. No, he's emotional, actually. Mm. Well, you know, I was thinking the song's very moving for me, too, and, and um, I hadn't listened to it in a very long time. And, and when Gareth said it's about an alcoholic and, mm. and I found myself being taken aback and thinking, is it? Wait a minute. What? Mm. And then I listened and, of course, it is. And it's about... You know, it's it sings of the the heartbreak and despair yeah. and the loneliness and isolation of the of the someone who is in the grip of. I mean, that's you know the mm. last verse of the song, and and because that has saturated so much of I think both our lives, where we've just been talking about that, mm. our parents and the you know, the the pain and suffering that they went through with this awful disease, and and then in our own marriage and for our own children and and uh, you know happily. 
that's been, all turned out well. That's been yeah. broken in in mm. the second generation. <clears throat> but the, the the song really brings that home so clearly. And it's the yearning, you know, that's behind it all, and it, it's wonderful because it's only revealed on the last verse. Uh, <clears throat> the yearning and the wish to belong and not being able to belong, mm. the wish, the desire for intimacy that that is impossible in the alcoholic family, because there's so much self-deception, deception, so many secrets. So many things that can't be said, all of that that goes along with with the alcoholic group, the alcoholic family, the alcoholic environment, and so that song always meant to me that you came home. With the work you do now, Garrett, which is really interesting, you're attached to the Betty Ford Clinic, and you were saying to me earlier, you often bring in the children, don't you? In other words, you're almost weeping in a sense now for maybe the child you once were or, you know, what had gone. And tell me what you do with children today and how that, in fact, can have a great impact on the family. Well, <clears throat> we, we bring them when we have parents in treatment or even not. Anybody, any children can come between the age of 7 and 12 who are living with an alcoholic parent or both parents. Or, and uh, we teach them perseverance and resilience because what they... The defenses they have to develop uh, with the outbreaks of rage and the in, the lies and the self-deception, I mean the deception of the parents, the shaming behavior, all of those kinds of things that they have to tolerate, they learn not to feel. They don't know how to feel, what to feel, because the climate is so inconsistent. They don't can't trust anyone. They can't trust their parents because they don't know what mood they'll be in. And they can't talk because they may be uh, castigated or excoriated or beaten or whatever it might be or criticized uh, it, there's no way for them to really belong so they go into themselves and so in our program we bring them in for four days and uh, six hours a day and uh, have a program that teaches them perseverance resilience and how to trust and uh, how to look after themselves and how to be safe in a dangerous environment because an alcoholic family is a dangerous environment, not just brutally from the physical point of view, but from the psychological point of view. The damage is sometimes immeasurable and can be life um, lifelong, attenuate a person's development. And we now know that adverse childhood experiences at an early age are embedded mm. neurologically and neurobiologically and will continue to be activated with later traumas in adolescent and early life. And so a whole person's life from the crucible of the alcoholic family can be uh, affected um, in, a, in both a positive and negative way because children learn at, also to overcome these kinds of disadvantages, but at what cost? Mm. And the cost is intimacy and a sort of peaceful inner life, which is very rare in such children. We call them in the United States and to some extent here codependent, the children who adapt their behaviors to those of their alcoholic uh, parents and of course the terror and fear uh, that they live in for a lot of the time never knowing when something awful cataclysmic may happen at the dinner table or anywhere mm. uh, is uh, puts them on warning as it were physiologically emotionally psychologically and spiritually that this is a dangerous place and I have to survive What's it like living with a psychiatrist to change <laughs> the subject? <laughs> well, it's great, except in a fight, you know, when he, te <laughs> he tells you what you really mean. You oh, know? I know. <laughs> so, so you have to be sure that you get, if not the last word, certainly the last laugh. And um, I send her a bill after every <laughs> yeah. fight. Does he analyse you over breakfast, Vanilla? No, no, no. Well, sometimes I analyse his dreams, you know, <laughs> which is extremely irritating for him, you know. But um, I think I, I should say that I've learned so much from from Garrett. And as he's been talking, of course, I've been thinking also one of the things that, that this this program at the Betty Ford Centre, the children's program, is absolutely wonderful. And it it's, it's operates from the institute that Garrett runs. And the, the thing that people don't know, I didn't know it for so long, was, of course, the training you get in an alcoholic household as a child and all the defences you learn to build up and not to trust and not to speak what you truly feel and not knowing what you truly feel, is that really what you're learning, you're learning mechanisms of defence and weapons that you then take out into the world. And the only place you can use those is in a similar situation. So, of course, you go and look for and recreate 
the similar situation. You know, you go out and look for an alcoholic or, a co- you know, you mm. look for an addict or you look for, you do. I mean, this is, and, the, and the, the examples are legion of people who divorce someone who's alcoholic and, of course, immediately start to go out and date someone, another alcoholic, you know, who's practicing. So um, it, that's the way I think it goes, and that's a terribly well, important thing. perpetuated down the generations yeah. that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah, and getting off alcoholism for the moment, because I don't want to define yeah. both of you in a sense. I know right. it does define in a sense. Well, I'd like to be re- re- defined as a recovering alcoholic because I've yeah. been in recovery for 33 years now. And uh, that's a different matter altogether. Which is great. That means you haven't yeah. drunk for 33 years. That's that right. It? Yeah. right. Well, but not only good, that, right? I have also a program and a fellowship of people who are also in need a fellowship to stay sober. Mm. And so I'm very involved in service to other alcoholics, helping them to get so we're outside of my work altogether. Yeah. One of the things, Miriam, though, that, you know, what we're talking about here, and we're talking about it in terms of a disease, and Gareth's talking about the treatment of it, etc. But, you know, Irish poets, playwrights, and, and songwriters have been putting this on the stage and on the screen and into books for generations. The heartbreak and the despair that comes about in families such as this. I mean, you know, John McGarren's writing The Dark, everything Tom Murphy wrote. I mean, the more modern playwrights, the young playwrights, they're bringing it out and putting it up there um, into novels and everything that Sebastian Barry writes. I mean, it's all there. Mm. The cruelty, despair, the abandonment, the longing, um, the, the terrible loneliness and isolation of this particular dilemma, or if you want to call it, rather than a disease within families. It's been there and it's been scintillating, glimmering, but the, the, the way to intervene on it and stop it in the generation, stop it destroying not only a family here in Ireland, but a whole nation, stop it destroying a nation, that has not been attempted yet. You obviously went into acting partly, Fanula. Did you go in there because it was so different and it could be almost not living a reality? Oh, well, I'm sure that was part of it because I read voraciously as a child and then when I started to go to the theatre, I went to the gate, you know, on a Saturday afternoon and I knew that they were having a lot better time up there on the stage than I was having sitting in that appallingly hard seat, you know, and uh, and I knew that's where I wanted to be. And, yeah, but it was also because it, it illuminates where you want to be, what you want to say, how the world can be if you're an actor. Do you ever think what would have happened if you hadn't gone to America? Because you wouldn't have met him, would you? You wouldn't have met Uh, Garrett. No, I probably wouldn't have, no. I can't even imagine what it would have been. I'd probably be raising hens somewhere. <laughs> which actually, I'd like to do. <laughs> he stopped you raising those hens. So, well, he won't stop me for long. I'm telling you, I'm going out to buy hens now. When I how did back. you end? We know how Fanula went out to the States, but why did you originally go to America, Garrett? Did you qualify as a psychiatrist here first? No, I qualified as a medical student here first, and I'd got into a spot of trouble here and there. So my father, who was the dean, talked to some people who came from America, from Johns Hopkins, looking for promising young men. So he offered me, and I went out there uh, (laughs) and uh, intended to come back uh, to maybe inherit his practice as a pathologist or whatever. But I I never did because I, in the first place, I'd, I'd never really had any ambition to be a doctor. I wanted to go on the stage. And uh, I'd had some talent as an actor, and I think there was some idea that I might go to the gate and I was all, when I was 16 and a half, um, very enthused about doing that as, a, as a, an apprentice. Yeah. My father said, no, you can't do that. You'll become a homosexual. <laughs> and I couldn't quite understand what all that meant. He said, it'd be better if you came and became a doctor. He said, it'd be cheaper for me because I'm the dean and wouldn't have to pay for anything. <laughs> do you regret and, that? What? Do you regret? No, I don't. I think you he don't. saved my life. Mm. I really think inadvertently, because if I'd gone into the theatre, I would have been dead by 30 because of my drinking, because there's no curb on drinking in the theatre. And many of my friends who went mm. in early no longer there, dead, from overdoses or whatever it might be, car crashes, and but all alcohol-related. So in medicine, at least, there's some kind of curb. You can't go to work, although I often did, with alcohol in my breath. Why did you become a psychiatrist? <clears throat> well, that's, <laughs> that's the funniest of all. N- not wanting to be a doctor in the first place, I went and was accepted as a pathologist because my father was in the University of Maryland. And then this was the, the, I went there in June and uh, in September and January came and I said, I don't want to be a pathologist. I don't want to go back there and deal with corpses and things. And 
And so uh, I called up Hopkins. And now, that's the premier medical school in the world, if you like, Harvard and Hopkins. Mm. And I said to somebody in the dean's office, um, my name is Dr. O'Connor. I'm here at the Union Memorial Hospital, and I'd like to know if you have any openings uh, for June. And she said, and what? Well, what do you have? Need? <laughs> and I said, I've been accepted as a pathologist in the University of Maryland, but do you have anything else? And she said, well, doctor, I'm not quite sure. And well, I said, would you mind looking? And so she came back, unbelievably. I mean, I, she said, well, doctor, it's extraordinary. It's January now and June, you know, we're normally booked up years in advance, but we have two cancellations. And I said, oh, good, what are they? And she said, one is radiology and the other is psychiatry. And I said, well, which would you recommend? <laughs> And she said, well, it depends on what kind of a person you are. She said, if you like people, psychiatry would probably be good. She said, if you're shy and don't like people, well, radiology, you don't ever have to deal with any patients. They're all on, on you can see through them <laughs> on, right. on in x-rays. She said, that would be good. And I said, well, what do you think? <laughs> she said, well, I, and then I said, well, psychiatry sounds good to me. And she said, well, but I said, put me down for psychiatry. And she said, well, doctor, there is a, an evaluation, you know, I mean, a, an entry procedure. So I said, set me up for it. I went. And I told them all this. I said, I didn't want to be a psychiatrist in the first place or anything. But they admitted me, I always think, for treatment rather than training. <laughs> and, that's uh, a great story. Yeah, and it's and true, absolutely you... true. And I went oh. back, actually, to check the people who evaluated me years ago, years later. Say, is that true? Yeah. They said, absolutely. You, were, you told us the truth and we admitted you because you told the truth. So said everybody else who comes in has all kinds of elaborate reasons as to why they want to be a psychiatrist. And you said you had no psychiatric training and that you'd read an article on psychiatry in the dentist's office, <laughs> which sounded interesting, except you were interrupted by the dentist and couldn't finish it. That was my reason. I love that story. <laughs> and, of course, you went to the beginning of the 60s, Garrett, and you went to the end of the 60s. Yeah, I went in 68. Yeah. What yes. was, when you were there first, Garrett, I mean, what was America like in the 60s? I mean, we're told it was an extraordinary place. Well, there was, you know, everything was happening in the beginning. The Joan Baez was there and Steger and all of the great singers and and uh, folk singers and Peter, Paul and Mary. And it was a great fervent uh, sort of anti-authoritarian. Then the Vietnam War came and all of that happened. Uh, there were the riots in which I was very deeply involved in um, in, in East Baltimore with the in the black community and there were the drugs and the riots. Yeah, and tell me about the Martin Luther King, the time he was killed and you were working in that hospital. Well, yes, I was at Hopkins and that's right in the middle <coughs> of the black community and um, I became actually, the, because I lived more or less in the community anyway and had the drug clinic there, um, the, I became the liaison between the hospital. The hospital was closed up by the police. And uh, I became the liaison between the community and the hospital uh, for four days. And uh, the police would bring in young men who were arrested for rioting, and I refused to see them. I was I had chief of the psychiatric emergency service, and I said, bring me in the young men who are not rioting, mm. because they're the ones that are ill. The only natural response to this awful thing that has occurred, this assassination of Dr. King, the only appropriate response is to riot and express your rage. Uh, I got into terrible trouble for that, but Fanula and I were later together and I was running this clinic and uh, very much well-founded in the community and so was she and uh, it uh, changed my life again completely because I was involved with uh, social movements, uh, political, radical political movements and all of that and was accepted and seemed to belong. Do you remember those times as happy times as well? Oh, you? I do. I mean, uh, the United States was a very different place then. I mean, as when I got there, the Vietnam War was raging. There was a huge peace movement, um, which was was strong and and uh, listened to. I mean, you know, and the the demonstrations on campuses everywhere were going. There were flower children all over San Francisco. You know, there was a, the, there were the Black Panthers. There were. It, it was an extraordinarily vibrant time. I was very aware of the fact that news footage which I had seen here 
in Europe, um, mostly Australian or French footage of the Vietnam War, showed us a lot more of the atrocities that were being perpetrated than um, than they saw in the United States. So I was sort of bewildered. I would meet people who had a very different version of the Vietnam War than what I had seen on the news, and and I thought that they must be hicks and they didn't, you know, they hadn't seen anything. But in fact, they were they were just terribly confused. And and I mean, there was a censorship, so um, because they had sons and husbands who were over there fighting. Well, well, that was a different time to be there because you could see sort of the old order of the Eisenhower America crumbling, you know, really crumbling and changing as the 60s sort of swept it away. And um, it was a fascinating and interesting time. But you always thought of home, didn't you? Which brings me to the next piece of music you both love, <laughs> which is The Harp That Once in Towers Falls. Yes. Why do you both love that? Well, I love it because it uh, it was sung during my childhood and I think it is a wonderful um, song about Ireland and it was, it's a song about... Um, I also think it's very timely for the particular times we're living in right now today in Ireland um, because I think the harp has indeed been silenced in so many ways. And I love it for that reason. I think that my father, my grandfather, were they were people who sang this song and I love it for that reason. How about you, darling? <clears throat> yeah, my father used to bring me two places on his own with just me and him. Uh, one was fishing, where there'd be long silences in the boat and criticisms of my inability to behave like an experienced ghillie. And secondly, to the Bohemians Club, which was on Tuesday night in Jury's Hotel, and it was a men's club where people sang these songs. And that's where I heard the harp that once uh, first. And it was very emotional for me because I was with with my father, and we didn't have to talk. We could listen and clap, and uh, it was wonderful. I enjoyed those things so much. But I, I always remember John McCormick particularly uh, because my father, being a pathologist, uh, wanted to pinpoint the exact moment when Count McCormick's uh, laryngeal cancer had begun to affect his singing. Mm -hmm. And so we would have these uh, almost experimental with different songs, and ah, there it is, the wow. first little... Uh, Cough and Burgess Meredith, who later mm. uh, produced uh, or I mean directed us in Fanula's wonderful play James Joyce's Women, mm. had actually a song <laughs> where he would sing a little, give a little cough as McCormick's cancer had begun to mm. interfere with his singing. Quite and right. so, yeah, I, I mean, I grew up with McCormick. I still have all his records and still listen to them in the car as much as I can. And okay, we're going to listen now to Count John McCormick singing Indeed. the harp that once in Tara's halls. <laughs> John McCormack there singing The Harp That Once in Towers Holds. It's been so interesting for me actually talking to you because no matter how much I've tried to get away from addiction and alcoholism during this interview, in fact, it's so, in a sense, important and embedded in your lives, isn't it? That it's almost very difficult to get away from it. I know you work with that now, Garrett. But at one stage in your lives, you both made that decision about sobriety to give up alcohol. Can you remember that moment, both of you? Mm-hmm. Can you? Yeah, Garrett? very yeah. much so, yeah. Yours first, Fanula. Like, wh when, when was the moment you decided, I am not going to drink anymore? Oh, oh, what I decided was, um, I, 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 everybody had said that my father was not drinking any longer, and in his later life he was diabetic. And, and I just knew that he was. I just knew. And I was uh, here, I came back home here for Christmas, um, just before Christmas one year and um, 27 years ago and and I, I heard a sound and I was going up the stairs and I turned around and across the hall and through the banisters I saw him with his back to me um, in the sitting room and what I and he always went around with a mug of tea in his hand all day long he had tea and and I realized then what he was doing because I saw what he was doing was screwing the top back on a bottle and putting it down into a cupboard where he had just tipped the whiskey into the tea. 
And then I then I knew how he was, you know, he sort of kept himself topped up a little bit all day long. And um, that prevented him going into a blackout or going passing out because the di- with diabetes he wasn't supposed to drink. And he always told people that he didn't. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, my goodness, that's how I drink. I don't want people to know, you know. And, I mean, it's the, the definition of sort of the secrecy that goes around it and concealing it, and and that's how I do it. And I, I don't... I didn't walk around with a cup of tea in my hand, but I certainly didn't, you know, before I went out in the evening, I would certainly, you know, have a few belts of wine and blow a few joints. And, you know, I didn't want people to know, so there was this sort of... I was ashamed of it, and at the same time, I wanted to keep it because I felt I needed it. And that was a huge awakening for me, and particularly when I thought I'd always said, I'll never drink the way my father does. And here I was, not exactly the same mechanism, but that's what... And it hit me. It was a realization, and I thought, I don't want to wind up like this. I don't want to wind up with diabetes. I don't want to die. I don't want to go on concealing. And and, and, and also because in any sort of partnership, and I think this is important, it has been so easy for years to sort of point at Garrett and say, well, he's the one who has the problem. And it's much more difficult to look at the supposedly non-drinking partner or the one who's managing things, you know. And 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 they get a lot of kudos for, in fact, people used to say to me, oh, you're wonderful how you manage him. You know, as if he was a parcel, and 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 I and I think that it takes time to be able to realize about oneself what's concealed underneath all that management and all that sort of looking good and 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 wanting to look good. And I was so terrified that people would think that I was crazy, and so I spent a lot of time looking good. So is that when you stopped drinking? That's when I stopped, and um, and that mattered to me because that was that, and I vividly remember that day and what he, my father's body looked like as I saw him do that. You know, he said, "I um, don't want to be that. I don't want to do that." But more importantly, what I realised was that is what I do. You know, I owned it for me, not just for him. And your moment, Garrett, wasn't it 1977, March 1977? Yeah, well, 19, uh, yeah. Well, I, I had left uh, the university. I resigned my position because of my rage and anger and inability to really do my work. And I resigned about two weeks before a tribunal that was being set up would have been set me free, as it were, from my job. Um, and so I set up a little practice and um, I only ever had one patient because she came in and I fell asleep. And when I woke up, she was gone. And so I realized and there was a bar upstairs and I would just go up there every day and drink. And Fanula would ask me, how's your practice going? I said, wonderfully, absolutely one, a very interesting patient. And how are the students? And I would go out with little piles of charts with my students. There were no students. There were no patients. And then I got a consulting job, which I completely messed up because of my drinking. And I realized, uh, that was three months later, I realized that uh, I, this can't go on. I'm either going to die from this or just end up destitute. Our marriage was in bits and pieces. The children were also involved in their own experimentation with drugs and alcohol. I was in despair and um, <coughs> decided that I had to stop and did. And went to a friend of Fanula's who brought me to some meetings, and then I began. And then a couple of years later, um, I had the gift of cancer. I got serious cancer in my rectum, and it was after that, I was two and a half years sober at that time, that I had to worry about whether or not I had very much longer to live. And I decided then to get into addiction, uh, and addiction treatment, and learn how to do that, and that was 1980. And I've survived the cancer and survived my recovery without a relapse, so... My whole life opened up. It's brilliant you didn't relapse at all. Like you yeah. haven't drunk no, since it, it can happen if you follow yeah. the program and do what you need to do. I know from the way we've been talking that it sounds like the entire moment, every moment of our lives is devoted to alcoholism or talking about or thinking about alcoholism or our own or whatever. But in fact, um, you know, re- really what we live and what we talk about is recovery. Because it's it's different and it's it's the changes in your life and what's made possible and the openness of it. So we're explaining something to you, but at the same time, that is what we live and talk about every day of the week. Yeah, and did it help? I suppose that you both had a problem with alcohol. Oh, yes, yeah. though it's most unusual actually for uh, marriages where where both people get into recovery. It's very unusual for the marriage to last. 
it's in, wouldn't you say, Garrett? It's, yeah. Uh, so yeah. what's the secret for you two then? Well, I come to Ireland a lot. Garrett's devoted to his work. No, well, recovery work. is the yeah. secret. Yeah. Recovery also means learning about how to be honest. I don't think before that, I don't think I knew and, and the terrifying things, what Garrett has described as the alcoholic childhood or the, the, the child within the alcoholic framework. Um, you do not learn honesty. People keep on saying to you, you've got to be honest, you know. You're not telling the truth. Well, you don't know how to tell the truth because it's dangerous to tell the truth. So it takes a long time, you know, to learn how to be honest and own one's own feelings, own one's own who you are. And just before we close, I think what's been fascinating for me as well is you you are the child within you remains, doesn't it? I hope so. Well, you find the child within you which was obscured and, and by, by veiled and concealed by shame and what I call malignant shame so that you never knew who you were. And uh, you were always in this state of anxiety, self-loathing, fear, terror, all of that. That was the way you got through the day and, and the drinking alleviated that and mediated it for some time. But the drinking com- created more Mm. As circumstances which made you feel even more ashamed and caused you to lie and to cover up. And I have all kinds of many, many stories about that. When people listen, you know, to the Michael Littleton Memorial Lecture at seven on St. Stephen's Day here on RT Radio 1, can you synopsize for me briefly, what are you going to be saying? Well, the title of the lecture is The Role of Malignant Shame in the Rise and Fall of the Celtic Tiger. And it's very much reminiscent of what uh, Fintan O'Toole is saying. And I just saw... Newspaper headings where he's talking about rage, self-loathing, shame here. And that's what I've been thinking about and writing about as the undertow, culturally speaking, because of history, uh, that besets us as Irish people and uh, prevents us from really succeeding and getting in touch with ourselves in ways that allow us to be joyous and free, happy, joyous and free, which is the, the goal of recovery. And I believe that until the nation accepts alcohol and alcoholism and alcohol abuse and uh, malignant shame as fundamental aspects of our existence here that nothing very much will happen. Malignant shame was the cause of the Celtic tiger and the cause of, cause of its beginning and the cause of its ending. Malignant shame has been there for a long time. The Celtic tiger was ephemeral. And a simple answer, what is malignant shame? Malignant shame, well, shame is, uh, I will try and explain that in the lecture, Shame is a very good thing because it motivates us to change. A little bit of shame, too much shame, healthy shame is what I call it, or benign shame, protects us and motivates us to change while malignant shame destroys us and affects people's lives in ways that they don't understand and is frequently manifested by rage, envy, begrudgery, self-loathing and these kinds of affects and emotions that have to be kept hidden because they are themselves shameful. And so you have a sort of vicious circle where the malignant shame controls everything from beneath and yet on the surface it appears that people are being successful as is the story of the Celtic Tiger. Which brings us to our final piece of music. Why do you both like the song Plaisir d'Amour? So, uh, <laughs> same thing, you know, same, it's about yeah. us and, and, and uh, it's, uh, it's about love and intimacy and betrayal and treachery and res- resolution and all of those things. Well, all it's also in about acceptance that uh, life is short, you know, <laughs> and uh, you better believe it and you better know it. And, and love isn't all simple and pleasurable all the time. And you better it's mean deeper it. than that. Mm, can be complex. But look, between you, it's clearly worked and it's been my pleasure to have you both here this morning. Thanks to Richard McCullough on sound, to my producer Eileen Heron, Vanilla Flanagan, Garrett O'Connor. Thank you both very much for being my guests today. The Michael Littleton Memorial Lecture given by Garrett O'Connor is going to be broadcast here on RT Radio 1 at 7pm on St. Stephen's Day. In the meantime, thanks a million for listening and I'll be here at the same time next Sunday. I will leave you with Marianne Faithful singing Plaisir d'Amour. Miriam Meets on RTE Radio 1 with Miriam O'Callaghan.